All right, I'm diving headfirst into planetary imaging. Player one is nice enough to sponsor this video and send me the Uranus C planetary camera for review and testing. It's up to me how I want to test it, how I want to use it, what I want to say. They have not instructed me to say anything at all. They simply agreed to the sponsorship and sent me the camera. So this is going to be an honest review, just like always with anything that I review on this channel. So we're going to do a quick unboxing of this, go through some of the specs, go through the sensor analysis that I ran on it to make sure everything matches up to what they're claiming. And and then do a quick session up against Saturn, fingers crossed, and show you the final image that I ended up with using this camera. My name is Rich, and you're watching Deep Space Astro. Okay, so we're just going to do a quick unboxing here. As always, comes in a nice package. I've already removed the cellophane, obviously, to so show you guys what you're going to get when you open the box. We have our ST4 guiding cable that I don't think anybody uses anymore, but if you do, you have that. We also have the USB 3 cable. Both of these cables, by the way, are, are branded Player One cables. Standard dust bulb, and then obviously the camera. And just like the Poseidon C that I reviewed a couple months ago, this one's got the nice coal, more of like a hexagon shape. I think the Poseidon had eight sides, but still. I really like the design of the case on this. We have a removable nose piece. You can see the sensor inside of there. Okay, so let's start by taking a look at the specs on Player One's website. So right out of the gate, it's not just a planetary camera. You can also use it for electronically assisted astronomy and lucky imaging. The camera does utilize Sony's IMX585 sensor chip. It's a 2.9 pixel size. 47,000 electron well depth and it comes in at 8.3 megapixels. Resolution is 3,856 by 2,180 and the diagonal is 12.85 millimeter. It is a backlit sensor um, using the Starvis 2 technology as stated here. And here are some of the highlights for the camera. First thing they're pointing out is it is a 4K camera. So at its max resolution, you will get 47 frames per second. And I did test and verify all of these claims with my own sharp cap sensor analysis. We'll go over as well in a few minutes. Big thing for me, no amp glow. Just like the review I did on the Poseidon C, which also does not have any amp glow. I don't like having to deal with amp glow. In my mind, good data in is the best data to have. I know the amp glow can be calibrated out, but again, I don't like to have to worry about stuff like that. So if I can, I prefer to use a camera with, with no amp glow at all. This particular camera that I'm reviewing today has a passive cooling system. There is a active cooling system that you can purchase as well. If we come back up top here under your purchase option, that's what the ACS says, your active cooling system. I just have the camera itself without the active cooling system the passive one if we scroll down here a little bit further they show it right here there's actually a heat sink with thermal conductive silicone pads to, to help keep that sensor cool it's not going to keep the temperature down as much as a cold camera will but it's also keeping it cooler than one without this passive cooling system in it so that's a nice little bonus about this camera if we scroll back up here a little bit and take a look at the tilt plate this is the second gen tilt plate on this particular camera and as you can see, the, the changes that they've made, they've gone from a three and a half millimeter sponge spacer to a five millimeter sponge spacer with a two millimeter deep groove. So what these improvements mean is that you have a larger tilt range that you can deal with if you need to make adjustments and the sponge spacer does a better job from keeping any light leak from occurring. If we come down to our performance graphs, you can see that the high convergence gain opens up at 210. And again, I did a sensor analysis on this, so we will be taking a look at my report as compared to what their claims are. But you can see right here down the bottom, this is our gain. On the left, this is our noise. And right at 210, we have a, a huge drop in the readout noise from 3.78 down to 1.072 and the same thing at that 210 gain if we look at our dynamic range our dynamic range is actually going up at the 210 gain setting so we go from 10.14 to 11.891 so if we come over and look at my sensor analysis again i ran this in uh, the latest version 4.1 of sharp cap and 
we can see that the numbers that they're advertising on the website are in fact accurate. So full well depth that gain zero is, I got a report back at 46,373. Um, they claim 47,000. There's variables involved in this. I ran the sensor analysis on my uh, LED tracing tablet diffused with uh, a couple pieces of printer paper. So, you know, that will fluctuate slightly. But the important thing is the high convergence gain, the HCG coming in at 210. So SharpCat tests the gain values in increments of 50. So we can't get right down to 210. But if we look at 200 and we come over and look at our read noise, and we can see between 200 and 250, it drops from 3.83 to 1.0. Same thing over here on the right with our dynamic range, just as they claimed. My report came in at 10.23 to 11.34 between 200 and 250. So right at that 210, we'll see that that increase in dynamic range. So, and again, the if we come down to the bottom on their website, they say right here under the readout noise section that all the numbers that they're advertising come from actual tests. They're just not making theoretical claims. They're actually testing their equipment. They do this with all their cameras. Um, and then they also encourage you to actually go out and do what I just did and run your own test to, to verify. So now let's go back and let's take a look at our frames per second. So as we looked at up top here, they're saying at 4K, the max resolution, we're gonna be at 47 frames per second. So I have fire capture running over here with the Uranus C attached, you can see up top here. I am running at my max resolution, so we are running 4K. And if you look right here at our FPS, our frames per second, 46.1, 46.2. To show you what this little camera can do as far as increasing your frames per second, we can take a look at some of the different sizes that we can image at. Like I said, this is 4K, this is, 3,856 by 2,180. If I drop the region of interest down to 640 by 480, which is something you would do when, when you're doing planetary imaging, immediately the frames per second jumped up to 416, 420 frames per second. If you wanted to get really crazy with this and take a look at how fast we can actually go, we can go from our 640 by 480 and let's go to 400 by 400. Now we're upwards of the high 400s to 500 frames per second. We can go all the way to 100 by 100, which it would be a very difficult capture. But if you'd made it that far, look at the frames per second, 1500 to 1600 frames per second. It's the screaming fast. So if you've been following along with the channel in my community post, I have only recently started getting into planetary myself. So let's get this thing hooked up to my imaging rig and we'll take a look and see how it performs and see if I can't get a decent capture of Jupiter. So what you can't see here is I do have a UV IR cut filter screwed into a nose piece that came with the Uranus C. Um, in front of the camera, I have a Celestron 2X Barlow lens, and the whole image train is attached to my Celestron 8-inch Edge HD, and we are going to be using Fire Capture tonight to see if we can get a good shot of Saturn. So as I stated earlier, I have just started getting into planetary imaging. So this final image that I'm going to show you guys isn't fantastic, at least not to my standards, but camera did a great job for me in, in at least being able to get this far with it. And overall, this little guy, I think is a great starter camera, possibly for somebody that's on a limited budget. Not only can you do planetary and lunar, you can even do solar with the proper filters in your scope. Obviously, you don't want to point your telescope up to the sun without the filters on it. And you can also do some DSO imaging with this as well. Um, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to all my members over on buymeacoffee.com and here on YouTube. Appreciate everybody's time. I'll see you in the next video and clear skies.